And there is some speculation that Paul may have been at the cross before his conversion. Don't have time to really get into all of that. But he was a leading Jew in Jerusalem, we find out from Acts chapter 8. And so there's really no reason he wouldn't have been unless he would have been out of town for some reason. He makes mention of a particular place in the epistles that makes it sound like he was there. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. We're going to look at this pivotal point in human history, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. It's so fitting he writes to the Corinthians about the cross because the Corinthians were seen and sought and, and thought to be unsavable. They were so wicked, and yet here the cross overcomes the wickedness of Corinth, and it can overcome any sin, personally or in a country as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, I want to stop right there and say in Acts 18, 8, in Corinth, it said many were baptized. What he's saying is he, he was the preacher. There were other people that put him under the water. Because it didn't have to be by Paul. It could be by others as long as it was in the name of Jesus. Their sins were remitted. So, so often people misinterpret that passage. But uh, he was just saying he wasn't the one putting him under the water. You don't have to get baptized by Steve Waldron to have your sins remitted. You need to go down in the name of Jesus Christ to have your sins remitted. Can you say amen? Amen. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. The gospel. So Paul was the vehicle. Others were the applicators, so to speak. So Christ is not a baptized, but preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. And this goes back to a group of people so often in that age, rhetoricians, and they were known as sophists, and they were professional debaters. They would be the meme makers of their day. And he said, look, I didn't come with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What he's saying there is if I would have preached with wisdom, you may have been all by my oratory. And Paul definitely had the mental faculty to give amazing oratory. But he said the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He said, because I didn't want the focus to be on me, I wanted it to be on Jesus Christ. Christ and him crucified. And then verse 18 says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And the us which are saved is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But I that are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of life and bring to nothing the understanding of of the prudent. What if we could ask God to help us have a more fuller understanding, possibly, maybe have the fullness of understanding of the cross and what happened at the cross? Let's everybody, if you would, let's talk to Jesus. Hallelujah. Even if you're watching online, let's talk to the Lord. God, I glorify you. I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we can never thank you enough for the cross. God, that which was so ugly to the world is beauty to us because it lifted the entire world out of sin for the potential for salvation. You carried every sin at the cross that had ever been committed. And we are so grateful for the cross, God. In Jesus' name, thank you for the cross, Lord Jesus Christ. Let everybody acknowledge the cross. Let everybody come to the fullness of the cross. In Jesus' name. And if you don't mind, let's everybody say, in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. So what is happening at the cross? There is a figure at the cross that the Bible says his visage was so marred more than anything. Isaiah 53. I remember hearing a medical doctor standing on the cross one time, and he made this statement. He said, I have actually dealt with people in emergency rooms that have gone head first through windshields in a wreck. He said, 
these people are traumatized and their face is so swollen, all you could see was two holes for nostrils. So it was just terrible. But yet we have the word of God proclaiming that Jesus' visage was so large more than that person did anyway. Think about it. His beard was plot ripped from his face. So he had horrific craters in his face. He was spit upon often during the few hours preceding the cross. He was hit with a closed fist and an open hand as well. He had a crown of thorns. So the thorns in those days in the Holy Land were an inch, very solid. And then he had been hit on the head with a rod by mocking Roman soldiers. And so his visage was so hard more than any man. And who was Jesus? Who was this person on the cross? There was a thief on one side of it and a thief on the other side of it. But who was the one in the middle? It wasn't just a Galilean carpenter, insurrectionist, so to speak, but it was actually God in, in flesh. And he was not just dying because of injustice. He was dying for a purpose and for a reason. He had taken every sin that had ever been committed, and he had become a sin for you and I. And so he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So the cross is at the very center point of history. It is not as an exaggeration to say, without the cross, mankind has no hope. With the cross, all people have hope. And so really, it is the fulcrum or the center point of human history. There is nothing more important than the cross of Jesus Christ. What well, think you of Christ? There's nothing more important what we think about that event that happened 2,000 or so years ago. And as we go to the words of the Apostle Paul, for Christ sent me out of that night to preach the gospel, not the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. It is very difficult to be eloquent looking at God incarnate being made sin with a marred visage with blood streaming out of both hands, the top of his head, his back ripped to shreds, blood on his feet, being literally the Passover for us. He just wanted to, as he said to the Galatians, before whose eyes Christ Jesus has been crucified, evidently set forth among you. He said with evidence. And so here he is in court, and he's preaching to Greek. Greeks, for the most part, didn't like Jews. Romans didn't like Jews. They were considered pariahs in that day. And here is somebody that claims to be the Jewish Messiah, and he came to save the world, not by a, a show of force, but by a show of love. It's like that old song by For Him, you may have heard. What a strange way to save the world. There's kind of this, that's all I really didn't care for, but I understand the point they're trying to make. That God came in place. Love was incarnated and took my sin and your sin. So he took everybody's sin. When you think of the worst persons and people throughout history, your Pol Pots and your Joseph Stalins and your Lenins and all of these horrific people, Hitlers throughout history, then you realize that Jesus took their sin. When you think of horrible crimes against humanity and massacres and genocides and sex trafficking and all this, and Jesus took their sin. So this is the cross. So this is the scene six hours on Friday as the old saying goes, where the earth has become dark. We won't talk about was it really a Friday, a Thursday, Wednesday. We're, just, we're looking at the cross here today. And so the darkness of the began three hours after he hung on the cross. And one of the people who reviled him was converted on the cross, which means just like Peter can deny him, but then come. And then there's hope for you if you've ever said you did not believe in Jesus Christ. Because one of the people on the cross said that. They're Jesus. One of the three that was crucified there. 
And then he goes on to say, for thank you for the preaching of the cross. Notice he didn't say, because there were many thousands of people crucified down the Roman world, this form of punishment evidently began somewhere around the 9th century B.C. by the Phoenicians. And that there was just one that we call the cross. There was only one that died that came to save. Can you say amen? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They look at the cross and they say, pastor or brother or sister or, or you know, whoever. They look at the cross and say, so this is who you're worshiping? One of the oldest depictions of Jesus is called the Alex Minos Gravitio. The Alex Minos Gravitio. And many people dated to the very first century A.D. And on it, you have a picture of Jesus on the cross from the first century or some A.D. Someone dated a little later than that. And there is a Roman soldier bowing down to the cross. But one of the unique things is it's a parody of the cross. It's like Charlie Hebdo or something. It's a parody of the cross because they have it with a mule's head. Or a donkey's head on the cross. And there's a Roman soldier by the name of Alex Minos that is kneeling to that. And it says, Alex Minos worships his God. That God, Jesus was considered God. They knew he was God in the first century. It wasn't a, a development over the course of the century. They knew he was a, the almighty God in the first century. But even then, they made fun of foolishness. It was foolishness that the Jewish Messiah, the people that they did not like in the first place, came to save us by being crucified and shedding his blood. Even the cross itself is symbolic. Jesus had his arms stretched wide like he was saying, the whole world is welcome to come. Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth because he was the mediator between God and man. He paid a price that he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. And so he was there suspended between heaven and earth. The day sprang from on high. God and man. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God is a spirit. The spirit you can't crucify. But God became a man, flesh and blood for you and I. And so, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. So the world may look at that as foolishness. You and I look at that like, there the burden of my heart was rolled away at Calvary. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so this is Paul's perspectives of the cross. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, he says this, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Why was it a stumbling block to the Jews? Because they were looking for a conquering Messiah to throw off the Roman yoke from them. So, from the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. The Jews have the stumbling block. They're like, the Messiah was supposed to come and deliver us. He did. But he didn't just deliver them from the Romans. He delivered them from their sins so they could be saved for all eternity. And so, the Jews are stumbling block. And then the Greeks, foolishness. The Greeks had Plato. Greeks had Alexander. The Greeks had Socrates. The Greeks had uh, Aristotle. The Greeks had Thales. The Greeks had the pre-Socratic philosophers. The Greeks had the Epicureans. The Greeks had the Stoics. The Greeks had all of this wisdom that they just sat around and chewed the fact of the world around them. But to them, it was foolishness. It was under the Greeks. What do you mean a Jewish God who was God incarnate died for the world? What does that even mean? Paul tried to tell in Acts chapter 17 that there was an altar to an unknown God and him whom he eagerly worshipped, him I'm going to present to you today. But yet so many rejected. Even with the great revival in the first century, most of the world did not receive Jesus Christ. So let's continue on looking at the cross of Jesus Christ tonight. The book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. 
verse number 11. Galatians 5, 11. Tonight, the cross is the most important thing in this world. What should be considered in the United Nations? What should be considered in the World Economic Forum? What should be considered on every website all over the internet is what do you do with Jesus on the cross? What are your thoughts about Jesus on the cross? What should come on the nightly news tonight? What should be on every game show? Jeopardy. What did every, should come on every television? What do you do with Jesus on the cross? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters for our eternity. And so the lady's the most important thing in all the world. Everything else is just window dressing. Everything else is distraction so often. So Galatians 5 and 11. Paul says this. And I, brother, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. You see, what he was talking about there is he's like, there were Jews that still said you had to be circumcised to be saved. Paul's like, there, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. There is, what you have to do to be saved is to repent and get baptized in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to acknowledge Jesus Christ, God in flesh, on the cross. You have to confess and repent your sins to him. And so he said, if you go about teaching and adding circumcision to the gospel, you see the gospel plus anything makes it something different. H2O is water. Add oxygen, another molecule of oxygen, it becomes hydrogen peroxide. Add another thing of hydrogen to it, it becomes H3O, not H2O. It's not giving life to anything. So Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, if you add anything to it or if you take anything away from it, it is not effective. And so this is what he is saying. So then the offense of the cross ceased. You've added circumcision to it instead of the offense of the cross because there is still an offense of the cross. You see, what happens at Calvary the cross is it is too exclusive because when you say it is necessary for Jesus Christ to have died for all of mankind, you're excluding all other thinking processes and religions out there. You may love the adherence of the people and, and you know, we advocate peace and love to everybody, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But you are saying that the only way to heaven, Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. He was not a way, a truth, and a life. He is the only way you and I can be saved. And so that is offensive in this broad-based world where people can look up anything on YouTube or Wikipedia or Google anything. We can talk about it to say, no, there is one plan of salvation. That is an offense of the cross. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, we see further, as many as desire to make a, a fair show of the flesh, you talk about circumcision, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ because they were preaching another gospel. Like he said in Galatians 1, 7 through 9, there's the, you suffer persecution for the gospel. They were preaching another gospel and therefore Satan didn't fight them. They were not suffering persecution for the cross of Jesus Christ because it was a different gospel. You were shedding your own blood to be saved in circumcision rather than the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, Paul puts it like this. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. People say, well, I thought you were Pentecost, so you believe in Pentecost, the power of the Holy Ghost. I do, but you can't get to Pentecost without going through the cross of the Passover first. You got to come to the, the cross before you ever get to the upper room. The cross is faith and repentance. You got to do that before, you, before Jesus' name baptism will ever wash away your sins. You've got to come to the cross. So we glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord means he's Jehovah, our God Jesus Christ. 
of whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. He's like, I don't care about the world. What he means by that, of course he cares for the people of the world, but he's talking about, I don't care about their Trojan games. I don't care about the, the chariot races. I don't care about the newest play that comes out in the rolling world, the Greek play. I don't care about all their politics. I don't care about the world and its loves and desires have been crucified to me, and I've been crucified to the world. Because they're like, why do you dedicate your life to Jesus Christ instead of doing all these worldly things? So he's like, I've been crucified to the world, and Paul was beaten. I mean, he was filling up in his body, the sufferings of Christ. And so he, the world was crucified unto him, and he was crucified unto the world. He's like, I just don't care. What the world's got going on. There's one goal of life, and that is to please Jesus Christ. You can be a billionaire, I hope you are. You can be a millionaire, I hope you are. You can become president, I hope you do. You can you can fulfill all your heart's desires. But if you don't have a right attitude about Jesus Christ, it is all for naught. Because you spend eternity in hell. And so we have to what think ye of Christ. The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. When we go to the very next book of the Bible, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, we look at the cross once again. Ephesians, chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. It's talking about Jesus. For he is our peace, who has made both one, and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In the temple of that day, Herod's temple... There was a wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the Jews. As a matter of fact, in archaeology, they have found pieces of that wall. And it basically says any Gentile who goes beyond this point will be responsible for their own death. The Jews at those days actually called Gentiles dogs. And so there were things, and trust me, Gentiles were reciprocated. There was a lot of tension. If you never read Ben Hur, that's kind of some of the tension in Ben Hur there, maybe just a little bit. But he's broken down the middle wall of partition between us. How do Jews get saved? The same way Gentiles get saved. It's all there at the cross. Hallelujah. And I am thankful for that. It's all at the cross. At the cross of the cross where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. So he made everybody one. You don't have to do a 23 me or DNA test to figure out who gets saved now. Whether it comes from the mom, the dad, whatever. Everybody gets saved through Jesus. And he abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for making himself a plain Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace. What that meant, we could not live the Old Testament. We were weak in our flesh. We had sinful nature. You've got a sinful nature. I've got a sinful nature that works on the inside of us. But Jesus Christ abolished that. He still has a sinful nature. But now we can live by the power of the Holy Ghost. He washes away all our sins. And now he lives in us so we can live in victory above sin. We're in the world, but not of the world. But even if we mess up after we're saved, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous, who is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Jew and Greek life, having slain the enmity thereby. Jesus fulfilled the law. Everybody from Adam on up sinned. It's appointed a man once to die. Death comes by sin. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. Everybody sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Everybody. Everybody has sinned. Every, you look at the Ten Commandments, I, I know the guy, that's how he witnesses the people. He just starts at the Ten Commandments, number one. Thou shalt have no God before you. Have you ever put anything above God? You ever skip church for yourself? 
You ever skip church just because you didn't want to go? You ever not thank God just because you want to keep it up? He just starts it. And by the time you get out, everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so that means everybody needs a Savior. And so that he might reconcile both of the God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. So Jesus never sinned. And that's the reason we have to be in Christ. Because everybody, according to our first birth, we are born in Adam with the seed of Adam. What does it take to go to heaven? To be born, live, and do one sin, and you go to heaven. How do you get to heaven? You're born, live, commit one or more sins, and then get born again and put in Christ. And that is the reason for the importance of the new birth. Because by one spirit, we're all placed in one body. So there's only two states of mankind. You're either in Christ or in Adam. You might be a very good, sincere, moral person, but if you're in Adam, as in Adam, all die. And as in Christ, all shall be made alive. There's only two states of mankind. You're either in Adam, your first birth. And you might read the Bible, you might pray, you might be a better Christian in most areas than most apostolic Christians. But unless you're in Christ, this is the importance of it. Because our righteousness is what? It's filthy right. We don't do good works to be saved. We get saved to do good works. All right? All right, verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were far off, Gentiles. He's preaching to Ephesus. Okay, Corinth, we talked about how bad Corinth was. Ephesus is where the temple of Diana was. That's probably why he wrote about the, uh, the uh, whole armor of God. And he wrestled with beasts at Ephesus. Because there was demonic spirits like crazy at Ephesus. And so the Jews that were far off and the them that were close, the Jews that were already serving God, for them we would both have access by one spirit and the Father. I'm talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for the cross? Jesus, God, the incarnate, there at the cross. It's wonderful. Philippians 2 8. What's bad so often when I preach or tell them the Lord to teach or preach on the subject, so many people say, you sound bad. Well, we can't let the Baptist have the cross. It's, it's, it's Bible doctrine. It's got nothing to do with denomination. Right? I hope it's right to you. Because it is true for the Bible. <laughs> Philippians 2, 8. This is all about Jesus. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You remember when Jesus was sweating as it were, great drops of blood there in Gethsemane, and he's saying, Father, if you can, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but thine be done. He learned obedience. It is humanity. In God, he can do anything. He never slept. He never hungered. As a man, he slept and he hungered. Jesus Christ had what's been called through the centuries of dual nature. We can debate the efficacy of that term. But he was both the Father and the Son. He was both human and divine in one person. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and gave obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. There was no more vile way to die than the cross. The spit of mankind all over him, the beard plucked out, the crown of thorns, that is symbolic, the curse, even me. Curse, crown of thorns, even ye, on Golgotha, the place of a skull. Jesus died to help your mind. So Jesus, the cross, who is the central focus of all mankind. Philippians 3, verses 17 and 18. Philippians 3, verses 17 and 18. I'm thankful for the cross. We've got to humble ourselves to the cross. We need to sing about the cross. We need to worship 
and, and praise the Lord for coming to the cross. Because again, without the cross, we're not saved. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so that you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now tell you weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. There were people that were once saved that then became enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice he says walk, and you have us for an example. For many walk, he's indicating these people used to walk the same way they did. It was like First John, that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For many walk, with whom I told you often, I'll tell you the weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So there are people that will try to tell you to be saved without Jesus, without the cross. Now, there's a doctrine out there, it's kind of a pernicious doctrine, it's called the life doctrine. And that people say that if people have never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and walk in the light they've got, they still get saved. They may not get heaven, but they get the new work or something. Well, if that's true, the worst thing you and I could ever do to anybody is tell them about Jesus. Because if they're saved without Jesus, and we tell them about Jesus and they reject, then don't tell them about Jesus. The light doctrine is not true. Jesus said, go in the world and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's only two states of mankind. And so if you may have believed the life doctrine and those type of things, be very careful with that. Because there will be people that would give these to the cross of Christ, saying to be saved without the cross. You and I cannot be saved without the cross of Jesus. The book of Colossians, chapter 1, beginning verse 19. Just a few more verses on the cross of Jesus tonight. For it pleased the Father that in him Jesus should all fullness dwell. For in him dwells all fullness of the God and body, and we're complete in him. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Okay, God is holy, we're sinners. God is holy, we're sinners. So God's judgment and wrath is coming upon us. But he put his wrath upon himself. The judge took off his robe. And took our punishment for us. We were condemned guilty by the judge of the universe. And the judge took the road and took our punishment. Took off his road, took our punishment. So he made peace through the blood of his cross. So everything, the wrath of God, is the reason the humanity of, of, of God, Jesus, or my God, my God, why is that forsaking me? Because the Father, the Spirit of God, you know, he, the Son, the King of sin, who knew no sin, he was that serpent, as John 3.15 says, you don't have time to get into it, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he became sin for us. He took your sins and mine, that's what that means. He took our sins. And so all the punishment for eternity that you and I deserve, Jesus took it. Jesus. Billions upon billions of people. Jesus took the punishment for billions upon billions of people. And that's the reason for the intensity of his march to the cross, his way to the Via Del Rosa, is because of that. Can you say amen? amen. All right. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things on, in earth or things in heaven. And so you read, and the people preach all about Old Testament saints, their sins through the sacrificial system being rolled ahead of Calvary. This is one of the verses that people seem to see a hint of that. Because he reconciled to himself things in heaven and things on earth. So it's like the Old Testament saints couldn't go to heaven until the cross, the blood of his cross. And so verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. To wit, God was in Christ, the Father was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's committed to you and I the word of reconciliation. 
I'm so thankful for the cross here tonight. All of us, our righteousness, our good works are filthy rags except the cross. When we bow to the empty cross, and the cross is the cross. Again, like verse all the way. The burden of my sin rolled away. Is there my faith? I received my sight. Now I'm happy all day. The cross of Jesus Christ, the center point of history. You and I cannot be saved without the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The Old Testament moral law that we couldn't do. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus lived the Old Testament. Jesus never sinned. And he just got nailed to the cross. So when we come to Jesus, we get his righteousness. He lived right because we couldn't live right. And so we have his righteousness imputed to us. I'm thankful for that. How about you? Amen. Let's go to one last verse on the cross tonight. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he said. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. So we're running. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. And here's what we're running. We're looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He was the author. So, like you're writing a book, Jesus wrote, everybody can be saved. He wrote the book. It's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and everlasting life. He's the author. But he also didn't just start writing. He's the finisher of our faith. Amen. He did run well. Why didn't he? So he's written, you can be saved. But he's also, the power of the Holy Ghost, able to make us finish the race. Now here's what was happening while Jesus was on the cross. Jesus has all the sins of everybody accumulating in the world upon him. Been beaten, visited some hard working man, back ripped to shreds, has purple robe put on him, back ripped off after the blood is so angry, and now he's going up and down on the cross for hours. He's unable to breathe properly, he can barely speak. When he speaks, he's got seven different phrases that he said, Father, forgive them, but they know what they do. He looks at at uh, John and says, you know, behold your mother. He looks at his mother and says, behold your son. He, he's wanting to make sure mom's taken care of. All of this is going on at the cross. They're, they're gambling for his garments at the cross. They're making fun of him. Even the thieves at a certain point, both of them are making fun of him. Every, you know, and they're just saying, if you be the son of God, you say others, why don't you come down from off that cross? All this, but what's going on in Jesus' cranium? Who for the joy that was set before You and I get to live for Jesus with eternity. We get to live for Jesus for eternity. So while all this noise is going on around him, he's looking at you, 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 and you, and you, and you, and me, and others around the world, and others that have lived down through the centuries, and he says, I'm making a way for you. I can spend eternity for you. You're going to be my bride. You're going to be my sons and daughters. You're going to be kings and priests with me. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, spit, the nakedness, all of that. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, which means he sat down on the throne of God, Revelation 3, 20, 21, among many other the videos on that. The power of God, right hand, the power of God. So, who for the joy that was set before him. So with everything else going on, the coming sin, agony, devastation, he was like, I want people to be saved. On the internet, I want people to be saved. Everybody needs to come to the cross. You can't make heaven without the cross. 
And why would you even want to try? Why don't you just humble yourself at the cross? There's this amazing picture. I think it's done by Ron B. C. I. And it's about a man that is a workman. He's holding a hammer in his hand. And he's totally collapsed. And Jesus is behind him holding him up. It's one of the most famous pieces of artwork in the 20th century. It's absolutely amazing. And that's basically what happened. My sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Your sins nailed Jesus to the cross. But he still had joy looking at us, saying, I love you. I care for you. The reason for the cross had nothing to do with the Roman, had nothing to do with the Jews, had everything to do with Jesus' love for you and I. I'm thankful for the cross. Paul, whenever we're preaching, I'm going to present the cross of Jesus. I'm going to present the cross of Jesus. It's the power of God and the salvation. I'm going to present the cross of Jesus. Amen. When the world can see the cross, it does melt the hardest heart. The biggest atheists and agnostics in the world, when they hear about the cross, they're like, when they were suffering, there. There's an old pastor who used to say you can trust a man that would die for you. Amen. Why don't we pray together? Let's talk to Jesus. God, in your holy name, in Jesus' name, I am so thankful for the cross. And God, we just ask that all of us live humble lives with the cross in mind. Lord Jesus Christ. Let this world come to the foot of the cross. Democrat, Republican, Independent, Lord Jesus Christ. Let the world come to the cross. Socialist, communist, Lord Jesus Christ. Libertary, whoever they are, let the world come to the cross. Jesus. Rich, poor, ultra millionaire, one percent or ninety-nine percent. Developing world, first world, religious, non-religious, God in Jesus' name, let everybody come to the foot of the cross. Jesus, let everybody come to the foot of the cross. Jesus let the world be crucified unto us as we're crucified in the world trying to show people the cross. God, we glorify you. We love you. We're thankful, Jesus, for the cross. We love you. Thank you that the cross leads to Pentecost and leads to newness of life. The cross is an effect about resurrection. And we're so thankful that you can come to raise us to walk in the newness of life. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.